Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doreen Carlson Stokes. I'm a candidate for mayor for the city of Rocky Mount. Um, I've lived in Rocky Mount for um, 30 years and always had a great relationship with the community. Um, some of you may know me as Teresa Austin from WRC radio station. Um, others may know me as a, an entrepreneur with Oakwood Bakery and Deli. But throughout those years, it's always been about the people, um, building relationships throughout the years and listening and hearing the concerns of the citizens on a grassroots level. Um, one of my platforms, of course, is housing. We are in a housing crisis, and just to hear the stories that citizens are experiencing on a weekly basis in our area, uh, housing, uh, one of the priority items that should definitely be on the list for our city. Um, one young lady just the other day, um, like two weeks ago, she lived in a home for a long time, and uh, the owners came and told her that uh, house would be sold, and the next day she got a knock on the door from the new owners telling her that she had to leave in 30 days. Affordable housing, along with economic development, which is part of affordable housing, um, equity, making sure that the finances that come into the city are spread equally across the city, um, and also concern about safety. Everyone wants to feel safe, whether you're at home or school, to public safety, and just a few of my platforms. In addition, it's always been about the community. I'm also a part of the Human Relations Commission in the city of Rocky Mount. Um, and also, just to let you know, it's always the people. If we're not here to serve the people, then we're in the wrong place. What's up, everybody? I'm Joshua Robinson, candidate for Ward 5 in the city of Rocky Mount. I always say the great city of Rocky Mount, but being in here on tonight shows you that we have a way to go to truly be great for all of our citizens. And um, I'm here tonight, and I'm looking at this picture, and the first thing that I saw was a gentleman who could very well be my uncle, my dad, my brother, a friend, and they just want it. They just want fairness. Um, you, you, you'll find out more about me on my website, but I'm here for you tonight. Uh, you know, I, I want to answer questions to the best of my ability. Um, as you know, I don't sit on your seat right now. But I'm trying to get in the seat so I can make sure that everyone has a fair fight. And that um, although our city is you know, one that is that can be strong, uh, we have dropped the ball in some cases when it came to our workers. And I think that your fight is a fair fight. It's an honest ask. And if elected, I'll do my best to ensure that you leave from the table feeling that. I'm Evan Silver, a senior uh, running for city council in Ward 4. It is just an honor and privilege just to be here with you. And when I sit out and see, I see essential workers. <laughs> when I see essential workers, I really see uh, what your efforts have been. Because if we don't look at it as how we protect you, we're not protecting ourselves. Uh, one of the things I'm running on is I think our city can do that. Uh, I don't think we have maximized all the potential to help everyone. As a matter of fact, I'm pushing young kids right now that everybody's interest may not be going to college, but they can take up a trade just like yours. And they can come out being certified. I went to uh, high school, I didn't have an opportunity to have come out with a culinary uh, being certified or uh, state of the art automobile certification. I didn't, I didn't have an opportunity, and I think they need to take advantage of that. And I do think uh, I stand in solidarity with you all, but when we think in terms of what our issues are, and more than what uh, under some graduate that we need to look at, when we think in terms of what you guys do, what you're exposed to every day, that nobody is conscious enough to, to reward you for your efforts. And when people stop looking at the dignity of labor, they stop looking at your value. So we want to make people and understand this, that I want to see every citizen be fair, treated fairly, to be treated with dignity, no matter what your skill. We should not look at your profession as a non-professional. Uh, just because there's a difference between a white collar job and a blue collar job, I look at it as a job. And our job, if we do it well, we honor that work that you do. And guys, I honor what you do, and that's why I'm here supporting you and standing behind you. Thank you.
one department, 36 percent, and I think consider 15 percent across the board for everybody to not uh, understand what your budget is. Right. And so, guys, uh, it is a shame that we are still here. The very reason that Dr. King came behind us in this sort of tournament for the same reason that we even talking about it today is just an insult. And we talked about moving progress, guys. We. I, I think people like Arnie Jones are the different ones that have stood up. We've seen those of you, uh, Mr. Petman, and all of you guys that have come to these meetings. But guys, when you think and consider what is fair to you all, I don't think what you're asking is an insult. I think it's what they should have gave you without even questioning <laughs> your efforts of even asking them from the first place. And so uh, it would have been me to vote against you. I would have voted for it. Right. I would have told them I had no problem. Yes, silver goes for it. I have no problem with that. And know that, that I think your work has worked. Right. I want to say, I want to thank each and every one of you for your hard work. You know it's not easy. And you are unappreciated, especially uh, it's a process of how um, you all were treated. The process is like, coming into a room and you have a family and you're treating one child, uh, you're showing them more favor over the other, even though you're from the same family. So I feel that um, when it comes to pay, that you deserve um, a decent um, pay. Someone can give you a, a salary, but it may not be decent. But I guess the, the situation, the reason why we're here is how um, you can give some employees a, a big increase without even having to jump through a lot of hoops. And then you all are, are asking for fair treatment and having to go through hoops in order to be heard. And what makes it even worse is the fact that you weren't heard initially. Um, and then when uh, you weren't heard, were you, were you really taken seriously? But we do want to um, say that we do support you. And, and um, yes, you do deserve um, a, a better increase, a decent, the word is decent, uh, raise. I want you to know where I stand. I support uh, sanitation workers and all our employees for the city of Rocket Mountain.
And so I do support um, sanitation workers increase. We're going to continue to bring this to the forefront. Uh, we're not going to let it die. We're going to continue to fight uh, for all our employees and our sanitation workers. And I, I do want to say something. Uh, when, when you talk about Rocky Mount is uh, one of the highest paid in North Carolina. North Carolina is the 48. We, we rank 48 when it comes to paying our sanitation workers. Out of all the 50 states in these United States, we are right at the bottom with the 48th state uh, of paying low wages to our sanitation workers. But what our uh, HR and manager has sort of manipulated because when they first sent the draft out, the environmental was not included in the draft, but then they went back and added it. They came from 5% to 24%. But then when you ask the workers that have been there towing the line, working when they did not have uh, trucks that was broken down, or trucks that was pieced together, or, well, so that they could drive the trucks, uh, when they did not have uh, yeah, a lot of vacancy, it was those guys and women that was there working, making sure that the job is done. And when you ask those workers been there five years or longer, they only received a 5% increase. And so when you look at the 24% increase, what they're talking about, that's the $15.51, uh, which raised up to $16.83. And then across the board, when you ask all of the city workers, even the manager said 437, something around 437 or 424 received the increase. So then the 560 something that did not, that is not right. And that's where the 6% COVID increase came. And so again, someone just pointed out to me, if you get a 24% increase, raising the, the hourly wage from $15.51 to $16.83, you would never get to mid pay. Right. You would never get to mid pay. That's right. And then you talk about Khalil, Khalil Lattice, everybody can't be a supervisor. So just reward our workers for the jobs that, they, that they're doing. And then it's a history of rocking, uh, not just rocking, but all across these United States. Uh, we had a citizen to come in and talk about unskilled workers in, uh, in, in education. But when it comes to the uh, upper management, you can hire a person that was making 66000 and then you hire that person making 170000 with less experience. And then you hire a city manager with less experience than the history of Rocky Mountain. And then you ask for $75,000 before he can come into the door. There's a difference in how we treat our employees, and that's not right. All right. How do you plan to address the wage gap and ensure that city employees receive fair compensation for the work that they're doing? Well, one reason is to change the makeup of this council. Because again, so we don't count those, they just count them in Washington. They count them at the general center. And we count them here when we want to count them. They take the majority to do anything. The city council managed to make uh, the, the, the manager. The manager does not manage the city council. And if the city council can't give the manager direction of what to do, and we don't have the votes, then we can't close that gap. It takes a city council that is sensitive, that is know the history, and that believe in inclusion, heritage, and prosperity for all. That's how we can close it. It goes back again to understanding um, and having having to have uh, empty border employees because in the midst of having um, the sanitation workers should not get a raise because we needed four votes. That says a lot about um, just having one additional person to come on board and not understand that you all are just as important as the policemen and the firemen. So it is election season, and 
That's all I'm going to say. But you have to have people in place who really care about the people and understand what you're going through. So um, that's all I have to say. Your voice matters. Your vote counts. So take it from there. Let me also say, add to some of the things that are something different than what was already said. I was reading something uh, two weeks ago. Um, you bridged some of the gaps of some of the things that you're doing right now. But let me tell you, back in 1990, what I read, the company CBC got 210 workers to sign a petition. And when they signed a the petition, they wanted to get a paid holiday. Okay, then. Went to take a petition to their uh, superior officer or their human relations person. And guess where he went? He was at the MLK breakfast where that event, where they, where they were not allowed to be themselves. <laughs> and, and when I think in terms of that type of history, of us understanding that, guys, we're going to bridge the gap by understanding that when people, what's unfair, what I have even seen with my own eyes, I have family members that work in there, uh, people that are in my ward that work with the sanitation, and when people don't value what you do, guess what, they, even the people that have longevity, you're not even there. Just think about the raise of your words. Some of you that may have been in longevity may not have gotten into that. Like, I talked to a police officer the other day. He said, and I said, how do you feel about that? He said, you know, his, his son is making more than him in the fire department. So how do you bridge these gaps, guys? If people don't value what you do, we've got to now change how we look at the model of what people are saying. Because how do you know how you get paid and get more? They look and say, are you doing more than what you should be doing? And so they don't think you're doing more. You're telling me you guys wish your life. Every time you go out there and expose yourself to disease, I don't even see some of the uh, ample equipment that, that I think you should have. Gloves, for, for instance. I'm just saying, I, I give protective face masks. Uh, I talked about health and safety, liquid repellent coveralls, guys. I'm saying, do you have, do you have what you really need? And that's how you bridge the gap and know whether they care about you or not, because those things are not. Ever just to uh, chime in, you said something that's very that really spoke. You said, Do you have what you really need? Mm -hmm. I think that that question should just just let it rest real quick. Do you have what you really need? Do you have it on the job, but also do you have it on the city council? <laughs> because, <laughs> what, because what Teresa talked about was having people that could identify with the workers. Uh, my background is sociology. That word that I studied was called cultural capital. What that means is having people that can not only identify, but that can also put themselves mentally in the shoes of those workers and say, Amen. I get it. Okay. I get what they want. So I'm not going to fight you for something that I can put myself in shoes and say, I'll be doing the same thing you do. Hmm. But when it comes down to it, I don't believe that we fully have a plan as a city. I looked at a comprehensive plan. Let me tell you something. When you look at a comprehensive plan, I was on the planning board in Zebra. It's three different areas. You got the planning board, you got the city staff, which is y'all, and then you have the city council and board commissioners, right? So, without with, with the plan in place, you got the instructions from the planning board as far as zoning out and other good uses to what's coming to the city and what they recommend that the city council does. Then you have the city council that carries out the plan. But you have the workers because guess what? Is the council members out there dumping trucks? Is the mayor out there on the truck? Are they picking up debris? You have to have staff to support the plan. Right. <laughs> the, last, the most current plan I saw for the city right now was 2003. And I'll let that just sit right there. 2003 was the last time it was updated. And I think in that same plan, they said the Rocky Mountain was well, estimated to have 95,000 people by 2025. And we're sitting there at 55 in 2023. Okay.
Um, do you all support uh, initiatives to provide or go beyond the annual cost of living adjustments um, that may be in place for city workers to keep pay pace with inflation? Cost of living wage? Yeah, do you all support initiatives to provide or potentially go beyond the annual cost of living adjustments um, that may or may not be in place for city workers to keep pace with inflation? Do you support? I, I support that and I'm looking at Council of Blackwell. Um, when we go back to our previous city manager, we did a, uh, a whole list of moving manufacturers City of Rocky Mountain classification and compensation scale. And when and it says October 2021, this is October 2023 now. So when this overview and the recommendations came back, we sent it back to our city manager because everyone was not going to receive an increase. That's the reason why we did not implement that. And then asking the city manager to have this compensation study done. We also asked her to pull out a certain department as far as disparity. Those three departments was public works, which included sanitation work, parks and rec, water and sewer, and the gas department. Because we had some issues in the past where um, the public works director would come to the city council, the city manager said, look, my line is, uh, Wilson is paying $5 more than Rocky Mountain. We need to increase their salary. No study, no whatever fiduciary or being steward of the city dollars, whatever the public uh, works director asked for, bam, it's gone. Because it was where it was very competitive. If one city or town was paying more, you had workers leaving to go for more. When it came even to our uh, police supply, no study done, uh, no fiduciary budget impact. It was everyone's tempted. But when you look at disparity studies and racial equity and equality, it's always got to be studied to death, seeing if we got enough money take care of the least of those or those that are at the bottom. That's not just here. That's, that's ingrained in the American way. When it comes to people of color and poor people, it's always we have to wait, we have to study, we have to this, we have to that. And so um, we didn't Adopt this study. When this particular study came back, uh, 2022, 20, 23, we did not get a book or buy it like this. Did you get that? So we couldn't really go through it and dissect it. We were just giving excerpts and just having different, maybe one on one conversation or by two, by the city manager, but not as a collective body. Uh, if, that, if that was done uh, when they when I said we well, day, the HR and the city managers sent out the draft. It did not include uh, environmental services. Then what they did is they went back and implemented what they talked about that 5% to 24%. If that was brought before the full board, we would say, wait a minute. Okay, if you'll go back and tweak or, uh, or, or amend this study, then you need to include not just 5%, but the 25% of what they asked for. Because you did 36% here, you did 27% here, they asked for 25%. But it must have been among a collective two or three, because it surely wasn't with this full body of city council that decided to just give those who did not get the, um, uh, the increase from the compensation study uh, originally. No discussion about that. It's like, well, you get what we give you. It, it, to me, it's like we give you the crumbs. Right. 
so uh, sometimes it takes whatever it needs to take to get attention, to get action done. Uh, everywhere I go, the people who I talk to uh, support the sanitation business. And I think that if you have more support
I already see what you do. I don't necessarily necessarily need to be with you. I'm just saying, why don't you have these elements? Why don't you have the uh, equipment to do what you need to do? And I am you know, not being, you know, so cautious. There's some things I know have happened. You talk about all the trucks that you're using up the car. Things that you need, are, is everything working? So those things need to be addressed, and that's what I would look at to get you the help. I think as a city councilman, one of the things to implement that I would implement to make sure you have what you need is uh, for one, having an uh, open door policy. My plan is once to be elected to actually have a space and create a space where you can come in safely and talk to me about issues and then guess what? That way you ain't got no excuse for somebody saying, well, I didn't get the email or I didn't get a phone call because no, you spoke to me personally. Um, I'm a person I love to talk to people at. Some people know that they to be But just making sure that we are listening, just to piggyback off what Teresa said, and that you have space to actually tell us what you need. But also, we got to do something. So following up on that, making a way that we track and say, hey, this guy came in and talked about this. What's the next steps? And have it visible. Because people, again, stuff can get lost. But it's going to get lost if it's tracked. We know you came in. We know you talked about this. So when we drop the ball now, we will exactly see who that person is. They should then they'll be counted. Well, I'm going to say some things that have already been done, things that we need to continue to do. Uh, I think that human relations all develop a little out of uh, the destruction uh, that the workers are having uh, in the city of Rocky Mountain. So, so you need, 
you need an open door policy where you know if you feel that one of your workers doesn't have to be in a certain status of what you what your role is, but can you hear you? And so uh, that open door policy, I think you know, we can agree with that. Okay. Thank you. The next topic is union rights and collective bargaining. How do you view the role of labor union in protecting the right and interest of city workers? For my studies, um, I'll say this. My first job was Walmart. And in Walmart, I'll never forget sitting at a TV screen in the back, you know, when you take the little modules. If you work at Walmart, you know you got to take the little modules. And I'll never forget that they had an entire day dedicated to telling us why unions were bad. Entire day, module saying, don't join unions. If you're approached by someone, do this, do that. I never understood that until I studied it in college and I saw that sometime around the 1970s and 80s when unions were really helping folk, that many governments didn't like that. In fact, in the state of North Carolina, teachers right now, we can't even unionize, whether you know or not. I'm a teacher, well, I was, well, I was a teacher. I'm done that food truck, I've got, got money now. But I was a teacher up until this year, this election, and we can't unionize. And I'm like, well, well why is that? Why can, we not, why can we not come together to advocate one another? If we do, guess what? We can terminate. We can terminate. So that's why they want to join, quote, unquote, these little teacher groups. They try to change the terminology, but they also limit the power. So when it comes down to unions, I know that unions have strength. I know the history of it because I've seen what they do. And I also saw that one of the wealthiest companies in the world invests a lot of money in keeping unions out. That should tell you a reason right there alone that we need unions because somebody is getting over on somebody. Will you support and uphold the right of city workers 
to engage and collaborate with unions to address the need and concern of city employees. We hope that with, with the new, with um, the change in the city council, that um, it won't be a lot of issues that the union would have to become involved with. Uh, we, we're going to treat do our best to treat everyone fair, and again, that's why we're here. Um, but, you know, as far as collaboration goes with the union from the city council standpoint, uh, I mean, I, I don't know of any other cities in, or having that's currently doing it. Um, but again, like I said, in Rocky Mountain, we have to do more. We play our own trade. But we show people how to work together. And I think if we can build that strong relationship, it's only going to make our workers uh, feel safer uh, and honestly feel better about their job. Will you support and uphold the rights of city workers to engage and collaborate with unions to address the need and concern of city employees? Well, it goes back to the previous question that we are in support of them unionizing, and we also give support uh, of them collaborating um, for their rights as well. I support it. We have an issue in the work that we need to join the union. Some of the uh, employees Would you support payroll deduction for union dues like Charlotte, Greenberg, Durham, and Raleigh? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I do. <laughs> 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 would, you, would you support payroll deduction for union dues like Charlotte, Greenberg, Durham and Raleigh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> community, the next topic is community, community engagement and workers' input. How will you actively engage with city workers to understand their concerns and ideas for improving city operations? that I would make, and this is something that, um, that needs to be done immediately. Take a day and ride with the workers and see what they experience on a day-to-day basis. <laughs> um, to make the decisions without knowing what they encounter on a day-to-day -day basis um, is reckless. They need to at least uh, take a week. I mean, spend time with them with the workers and see the challenges they face. They don't even think about the fact, I'm sure that sometimes when you all go out, you might encounter dogs, you might encounter, <laughs> you might encounter uh, um, someone might put something in the trash. Of course, we mentioned earlier that was hazardous. I think that if they were really getting a taste of what it's like 
not just to be um, an environmental service worker for a day, but do it for a whole week. Amen. Uh, uh, be an eye opener for them. Teresa has identified something, guys, that, you know, what's, what's unfortunate is that a lot of times people that make the policy have no clue what you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the ones that are making the policy, right? And she's, she's exactly correct. Get out and, and do what you do. I guarantee you it will last an hour. Amen. And so, so sometimes, guys, you have to show, uh, sometimes we have to document some stuff. You know, you got you know, and then how, how can we even get better at what you do? Because if, if there, there's sometimes, really, I'm not going in there, y'all, when I see a pit bull, <laughs> and he's not chained up, right? But we still got to do what? Get the trash, right? So, so there are ways that we can help each other, but I will say this. People that say it, though, of course, again, I say enough that makes policy, they don't, they don't do it. Yeah, I, I agree exactly what Teresa said as far as just, you know, getting out there for, getting out there, see what it's really like before you actually try to uh, pass policy. For example, pack, getting trucks to order with no AC. Come on now, if y'all ever work anywhere in the summertime, outside, and you hop in your car, and I have an AC work, you gonna turn that AC on full blast. I can imagine working in the sun and then hopping in my truck with no AC. After a long day of work, you might even pass out in that car, then they got a lawsuit. But that's a little conversation right here. <laughs> I agree with everything that everyone said. But just listening to the word of the you said, you'd be surprised. Next question is, for you establish the mechanism for workers to have the direct voice in city decisions, making process that affect their job and life. Well, definitely. I mean, how, as mentioned earlier, how can you uh, mechanism for workers to have a direct voice in city decision making process that affect their job and life. The key word is um, it's direct, right? The key word in there is direct. So for point of clarification, I would love to you know explore further what, what do you read, what do you mean when you say a direct voice? Um, because I know you know direct can be many things. One of the ways that you have a direct voice is right now is the early voting going on. Get to them polls. That's, a, that's one way that you can have a direct voice saying, hey, I'm tired of this guy. He ain't even trying to call the vote for me. Or he can vote against me. You know, that's one way to have a direct voice. But I also believe in creating a space where we can collaborate so we can hear their voice and say, you know what, I think that is bad. I think it is a valid point. And we're going to talk about it before the city council meeting. Not in, not in no closed door with just my little bit, but we're going to talk about it beforehand uh, so that you don't have to come up here and beg for an increase or protection. So we have to put something in place to hear you and hear you out. Yeah. 
And it's important to know that when creating this, it's not just going to benefit y'all. That's right. Every department in the city can benefit from these very mechanisms exactly. we're trying to put into place. Yeah. So you know, that open door policy, if it's believed, y'all ain't the only one with some issues that, got, that can't, don't feel like they can go to their supervisor to really get help. So these mechanisms that we're talking about, and it's not something that's going to take no 90 days, is this one. <laughs> it's going to be something that, you know, I feel like can be done. They want saying, hey, we need an open door policy. We need someone they can talk to safely, and we need a way that we can hear them directly and actually help them without it taking all year. Well, uh, I guess the direct mechanism is the roundtable discussion for open door policy. Uh, just from experience, Black women have been tested this. Um, you have to be as a council member approachable. So, regardless of where we go, whether it's a grocery store, a funeral, a baby shower, a Christmas party, or just out and about, if people know what you stand for and you're approachable, then they'll come directly to you. <laughs> Next question is, what strategy do you have to promote diversity and inclusion in the city workforce, including leadership positions? Well, let me just put something to the oldest one, not oldest one in age. <laughs> uh, 2023, we became majority as a mayor council. Uh, city council. Oh, 2000. And when you look at the management of City Hall, it did not mirror the population. Uh, we only had two uh, black department heads, one female. That was Charles Penny, who was assistant city manager. And we had uh, Ms. Loretta Braswell in the relation. And so, started to uh, change policy where it could be a, uh, uh, far as uh, when it comes to interviews and, and, and uh, search team or what we were actually looking for. And it opened it up. And now when you look at uh, upper management or City Hall, it's, it's a diverse uh, uh, minority, people of color, female in position. That's one thing um, that, that we did. And so um, you have to understand, um, you talk about inclusion, because you never experience it, and then you don't have the knowledge, then you really can't advocate for it. You really can't advocate for it. Really advocate for it. I just want to say this. desk and he 
tickle pencil off the desk. And so the teachers saw him and thought he was still. Well, if you understood this culture, they, they don't look at that as still, they look at it as sharing. They share everything. Mm -hmm. So I went to the principal's office and told me, so to understand diversity and understand we can't look at each other just like we're in this room tonight talking about why is there people of color that always sometimes don't have their acts, right? If you understood our culture, you understand give me a chance or give us a chance to understand that we have the same students and not them. We had a lot of things we carried on our backs for years, but yet here we are again trying to get understood. Um, I would say be sensitive to the needs of the citizens, which reminds me of something um, that is happening in the city recently. Um, our special population. We would have different activities in the city, but our special population was excluded. But now uh, that has changed, um, in, especially to have different activities. I think uh, just this past summer, there was a special population problem. But be more sensitive to the needs of the citizens and address um, those. But many of the parents were saying that, uh, that they just didn't have the activities and they uh, weren't involved in a lot of things. So there is more inclusiveness um, where those programs are in place, but without listening and hearing that there was a need for those um, activities, we could not address them. Again, it goes back to being sensitive to hearing the needs of the citizens. At this time, you may uh, get an audience, an opportunity to ask questions they may have. <laughs> you can go ahead. Uh, okay. Hi, how are you doing? I hear everybody talking about the city workers. I would like everybody to see the city workers' families because they are going through struggles as well as they are. Because they can't get an increase, their families are really suffering at the hands of them too. So I would just want everybody to consider their families that they have to go home to that they can't hardly even provide for them. You know, because they can't get this increase or they can't get a raise. So I want everybody to consider their families also. Thank, thank you for your comment. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, we're going to ask answer questions. We'll do questions first, and then we'll make space for comments. But you kicked us out. That was good. Thank you. Anybody have a question? Mm -hmm. okay. uh, just to get things in perspective, and, be, and I know you, you ought to move the answer before you ask the question, but for the city workers, pay and benefits are included in that retirement and, uh, and health benefits, so forth. How do they compare to the private industry? How, how, how do workers' compensation and benefits compare to the private industry? What is private industry paying for the same type of job? Well, I think probably uh, I mean, I was under the impression that he just said tonight, if I was going to step down here, he said, we're number 48, you know what you said? So he said uh, it was 48 for the state as far as the, you know, the city paying sanitation workers. Now, the question is talking about conversation as well, right? Probably, yeah. probably, yeah. probably yeah. that's what you're yeah. saying? Yeah, so, I, I, I don't, I mean, to be fair, you've got to not only compare city workers to city workers, but also to private workers where the where the, uh, the competition is. How does it there? How does it compare to what people working in private industry make in a similar position? So the Nazi goes. Well, I wouldn't have those no, no information, no data. For, so private companies right now, I think that, you know, I don't know if Andre had y'all looked at um, where what private companies are doing. Just through uh, research, even uh, private uh, companies are not paying, uh, you talk about sanitation workers, what they deserve. Uh, when you look at the state of North Carolina, we How does 
that compare to the private industry? Uh, well, both and, and uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. And that I can get comments from other people in the audience. We have another council member here that can maybe address the question you're talking about in current study. Thank you. So, so and again, I'm not trying to feed anybody an answer, but to answer that question. Uh, when um, about comparing public workers to private workers, you know, we don't compare apples to those apples because it's not the same apple. That's right. So when you look at outsourcing, which is what many city governments do, they save money um, on public works functions because private companies don't pay benefits. They don't necessarily pay competitive wages. And oftentimes when you look at who they're hiring to drive the trucks and do the work, they hire undocumented workers oftentimes. So they don't have to pay competitive wages. So one of the, the challenges I believe the governments have to make philosophically is that is every evaluation of a job based on how much you can save in a job? Or is there a demand for government to ensure that it embraces the constituents that comprise the government. And I believe that, um, I do not know who the study, who the pay study, I'm sorry, I don't know who the, who the pay study, what other entities were studied, but I'm pretty sure they just compared the wages with other governments and not with the private sector. And I think that's one of those philosophies of Rocky Mountain try to hold true to is that instead of outsourcing um, activities, we emphasize making sure that everybody in Rocky Mountain had a place to be able to be included. And we've even seen instances where some activities in public works have been outsourced to private companies. And they might do it at a competitive rate but those workers aren't getting the benefits of that contract. It goes to the people who are running those companies. And that's inequity. And if we are working on a perspective of equity, then I think that that's where the conversation has to be. So I think I heard somebody say that maybe Rocky Mountain should be um, courageous in taking the lead and maybe changing the way we look at all labor, that we value all people try to um, ensure that we give them the best we can do, whatever it is. So I think that that's a difficult conversation. Yeah. Not, it's not apples and apples. The apples aren't as pineapples and grapes. With that being said, I want you all to take just a minute um, to see how you all were treated to just even try to have a conversation to meet with the city manager was a very big concern. And we have to wonder, were there plans in place to get a private person to take over the trash? It's something to take into consideration because they have you to come to the council time and time again and to practically beg for a meeting where there are already plans and thoughts into play to possibly go to subcontracting, but that would take jobs away from you all. So we need to keep a close eye on this particular situation. Was that part of the a possible plan that wasn't being told? Until we find out additional information, what are the reason would they have to ignore your pleas to even have a meeting?
Second question is, uh, it's often we're talking about the well, city manager. I'll, I'll give you a chance to do the second question. Let's just let them answer the first one, and I'll get, we'll go right back to you for the second one. So your first question again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> lately, our most important item, uh, city council involved with the voting. It's always been a four, three split. Uh, I'm just asking how can you avoid uh, that and getting all seven on board on certain issues or five, two, but it's always been four, three, especially the two <coughs> guys, the two gentlemen here get elected. Well, for me, uh, I, I think I've said this at different forums and different platforms is that once you, we learn how to disagree uh, and then look at the uh, sense, overall sense of how it's going to benefit all people, then uh, none of us can say what we may vote or vote against unless we're there uh, on an issue. But now, if it's something concerning an issue I truly believe in, I, they will have my support. Be a four three split. It'll change. It may be four three, but it won't be the way it's been. All right. Okay. So, so again, looking at our current issues, then yeah, I would, I would change that. But we, we respect each other's differences. I think we can get to accomplish what we need to accomplish for the people. Then that may not be my way. So you have to, you know, see what that is that's benefiting the citizens. Well, and um. One of the councilmen tonight, um, one of his viral videos, uh, I've seen, and I say viral in this sense, uh, my opponent, uh, Elias Dodgers, had said, um, you know, when you voted for a ticket, we're talking about that $75,000 raise, um, the city manager guy. And he said, well, you voted for it as well. And uh, Councilman Knight said, because I won against it. I think that that alone and that could, now many folks ain't talking about that aspect, but we have to get to the point that when we're voting on things, mm -hmm. that we be real too. You know, Andre, I mean, he probably didn't want to get no $75,000 raise. I mean, he probably, he's already put those expressions in there. But he voted for it because he wanted the council to be unified. I mean, who wouldn't want him to be? The Red Pill was trying in our city right now. But when we're looking at that 4 3 split, I think, like you said, me and Everly, we probably won't see too many more 4 3 splits. But I think it's definitely going to be a case where. We just don't have to be honest about everything. And I think having information before a meeting is going to definitely help out with talking about these things before we vote on it. Those are the last minute is dangerous.
policy that we may uh, be regressive. And so then you have a, 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 a two, two, which make a, a four a majority, and a four, three, and four on the same page. Second question, and then we'll thank you, Jim. I'll try to say it as clean as I could. Okay, under the four previous city uh, managers, uh, Mr. Faber, Peter Lonnie, Mr. Charles Penny, and uh, Tom Small, you can almost see them at any time. You can, if they are there, they will see you. But under this uh, city manager, it almost take a uh, act of Congress to see But they cannot. It's always unavailable. Uh, it's always in the meeting, called different times on different days. And uh, I, I think you don't mind if I call the name. Mr. Glenn Drummond and I have been trying to be on his agenda. Is there anything that you could say or do to make him available to the public like the other four people to the man?
For me, it's not political. It's meeting the original sanitation workers and hearing their stories and their struggles. It was nothing political about it. It was hearing their real life testimonies and then having to see the sanitation workers who are currently working experience the same thing. It wasn't political. It was true cons uh, being concerned. <laughs> let, me, let me make a comment right here. It wasn't just about the sanitation. It was about all the city employees. That's what they that's what they getting the whole thing mixed up. Getting mixed up. It wasn't just about the sanitation. It just that it happened to be thrown upon the sanitation. But we are advocating for all the city workers. Because all the city workers deserve a fair wage. Yeah, I'm going to say that, that as well as that uh, a lot of times, um, last I checked, and uh, Mr. Jones is here to correct me if I'm wrong, last I had a conversation with him, he was fighting this for six years. This <coughs> just happened. So it is a real issue, and it? it is a real need that they they need a raise. And I, and I, and I support that. And at the same time, as, as uh, Mr. Petway said, this for Street you talked about said no to cost of living increase to the city workers across the board, which is an insult. So, no, it's not political for me. It, it is a consciousness of saying, man, they got shown again, and their value has not been appreciated again. And so, uh, and again, not, if you're not sure, you ask the question, you we don't have the citizens across the board to vote. We can't tell them anything. Mm -hmm. To tell you the truth, right. if you don't have that 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 citizens across the board that you thought you would have, you know, there are a lot of things. But again, if you don't put these, I would say, put some policies in place. We need policies in place to protect your wages, all those things. But this is not a political move. It is really what they deserve and they need. And they've been asking for it for a while. I think to be honest with you, it's gonna be both that no matter what our vote is, they gonna still say it's political. Yeah. It's gonna be both that no matter how far we fight with you, they still gonna say it's political. You don't know why? It's campaign season. But it's not our fault that this issue landed right in the middle of our campaign season. But we definitely gonna talk about it because why not? This is the perfect time to talk about it.
2021. Uh, the raise is the lowest hourly rate was uh, 971 and 1036, and it went up to $15. Uh, and this study went from 1581 to 1683. And so when you look at it overall, the state of North Carolina, you look at wages are low. And so uh, when, when that set the stage, for towns and municipalities, especially some towns and municipalities, so it does not have the population to grow. It's, it's difficult unless you raise taxes. But you look at cities that have, you know, a healthy fund balance uh, and have money in, in the coffers that we can do that. Uh, and we can demand that and we should look at that. Uh, when you look at, uh, I can pull this up, our Top administration, you know, our city manager at two hundred and thirty-five thousand uh, dollars a year. Uh, another department, one hundred and eighty-three, one one seventy, one fifty, one sixty, uh, one hundred and thirty. And so those are very, very good salaries when you compare the state of North Carolina. It's like wow. And even when you look at North uh, Carolina, you said y'all paying very good money when you look at city manager. Exactly. So it's a you know. And people are like, why are they, you know, people are protesting uh, at these automobile you know, companies? You know, you got the CEOs all over the place, and then you got the workers or not. And so it's a union to demand. And I think uh, for uh, the NAACP, uh, the union, different organizations, we're pushing it with more funding that the hourly rates of the was very low. So, you know, it comes through the power of the people and then for those who you elect. I got paid 200 something dollars, I'll talk to your dog. So if I make got paid 200 something dollars, I'll talk to your dog. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I have a question with, um, you talked about having an open door policy. Will you, if elected, if elected, um, be reachable? by phone or email for people to voice problems, issues, questions, or whatever, a contact. Will you put that you know, out there for us to reach you? Let me just be realistic because I'm the only one that's on the council. For reporting like Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes it's almost in, impossible to answer every call. Council until 2003. Uh, city Council was just sort of like volunteer. This is not volunteer. So anybody put this paper in, you can volunteer two hours a day and you go home. It's not like it has become very demanding. And when you have people at the table that can address the needs of people, then you receive abundance of calls. And so when you look at larger cities, you have city council members that are full time. That's they right. have an office, they have mm -hmm. a staff. If mm -hmm. you call about your trash, a pothole, or a housing grant, or an issue, you have a number at City Hall, you have a secretary that can log this stuff in, they can follow back up. A lot of times when constituents call us a city council member, we're reporting to the staff. The staff was hired to do the work. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking, well, we haven't heard anything that the work has been done until you run into somebody at the grocery store. It's like, oh, you, I told you about this several months ago. The tree is still alive, you know. And someone, you know, you haven't done anything. But it's a lot of things fall through the cracks because you don't have that staff to follow up on the issues that are being brought to you by your constituents and um, the employees. Because most of us, uh, for those that have money, uh, have a full-time job. So when you have a full-time job and family, and then you're doing city council and other things, then it's, it's, it's very uh, 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 taxing, unless you have that staff 
to help you manage this stuff. Because a lot of times staff don't follow up or do what you ask them to do. And if you, if the constituent don't call back or the council member don't remember to call back or follow up on the email, then it falls. Let, let me say, I know one of, one of the things, uh, I thank you for your question, but I, I would also say that you to help us identify maybe an issue we need to look at. How do we handle that email? How do we handle those calls first in, first out? Uh, some people may have a little more weight because of the relationship. This time is relationship. Some things don't get done quicker because I know somebody. So how do we change those efforts or change the way we look at that? And so. Uh, I know for me, uh, listening to Andre, that it may be something that we have to look at as new city council persons. We say, look, how can we handle this now? This is an issue because you're not the only one. I, I, you know how many people have stopped me at a grocery store, black and white, and says, would you be accessible? Because in the past, my city council person hasn't. And so I'm like, and I'm thinking, you know, well, um, I got to look, look at it. You know, I have four, a little over 4,000 people to that, that, can, that can contact me in my ward. I can't handle a whole city. That's absurd to agree to that. But if I can at least set something up and say, I got four, a little over 4,000 people in my ward, how can I make myself accessible to their needs? First in, first out, and that's something I look at. Yeah, I think um, over over 1,000 people today probably have my personal phone number because I've been calling people every day and texting them trying to earn their vote. But in talking to people and walking in the community, that is also a concern that I've heard. People saying, I can't reach so and so, I can't reach him. I ain't never seen him in my neighborhood. I ain't never even seen him at the grocery store. I don't even know if he eats food. So when it comes down to being reachable, I don't think that that's going to be a problem for me because I've already made it public. You can go look on my page that I will be out of my salary making sure that I have someone that can help me stay in touch with my constituent, whether it be someone that can just answer phones and emails and a 24 hour policy that I will respond, or you will get a response from me no matter what. And that's just for me. Um, maybe the city can help with that. Maybe it's something we can look at doing on the city level, but if don't nobody else do it, Joshua Robinson and Ward 5 on it. We got two more questions. Two more questions. Anyway, yeah. uh, uh, Walker. I, I really don't have questions. You can read it. Uh, I have an yeah. announcement, and the reason I need to make it. Yeah, we'll, 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 we can address it. We'll 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 address
that you mentioned with the other. Okay, I'll hold that. If there's any other questions related to the forum for city workers, uh, then we'll take, we'll, we'll take that as a precedent. I have a question. I will, I've worked with the city for over 25 years. And I see, I know that the city has a pay rate at a minimum, a maximum, and a, uh, a maximum, a minimum, and a mid range. Right. Okay. What, I, what I'm concerned about, what I'm going to ask the about, is because of that, those three elements, that a minimum, that, that yeah, mid range, mm -hmm. and that maximum. Mm -hmm. People that are working with the city, city employee cannot reach their full minimum for a long time. And when they, when they get to that, when they get out onto that minimum, when they give them a raise, they push them back down. Hmm. Okay? So what I'm thinking is, the only way you can get a full uh, a raise is when you got a uh, supervisor they give you a fair evaluation. Right. And if the evaluation is not being done fairly to the city employee. So when as you look at it, when you look at the um, the evaluation, you got city, you got city supervisors, superintendents who don't like you or have a have an art against you. And so when you come up with evaluation, he gives you that a number one or two or something like that, and don't never you never reach that, reach the full potential of your thing. Even though you out there driving the truck all day long, even though you out there uh, picking up trash, even though you out there in the street department, whatever department that you're working in, is there some way that you y'all can come up with something to tell these people that they gonna get a fair rate, a uh, fair uh, evaluation out of that? Out of that two fifty, out of the two fifteen of supervisor. Well, I think. Well, what is currently? I don't know what's currently your value fair evaluation tool. I think that's one thing that has to be looked at. And are there like career pathways that clearly have checkpoints that you got to accomplish as you matriculate up, the, you know, through the ranks or what have you? Because if there's no tool, then that's going to be our first first step right there, making sure that there's a fair tool in place to evaluate. People. Before I answer that question, let me, can I ask a question of the Home Depot? Is that, does this, do you guys have a union that, are you a part of a union as it relates to right now? No. So, right, so you don't have a union, so, so you need that, right? You need to put that in place. I would suggest, I would put that union in place. That union needs to have an attorney. <laughs> and these things will help you. And I know, uh, Sometimes you got to figure out maybe the cost of that. I don't know. We have to look at all these variables. But, but again, to protect you, talking about your rights, what's going to happen, have you maxed out with what you're saying uh, to some of your things, or, or maybe not getting a fair evaluation? You can't max out. All right, so I'm saying. The way you got it, you can't max so out. You can't max out. But so they only give you a 1%, a 1%, or 2% rate. Right? And that's so it. you get a 3% increase, or 4 or 5, that's going way up. And that's only those that they are doing. But the reason, I, reason why I say this is that I could never get an understanding of how that mid, and mid range manner, mm -hmm. that mid range, and it might even work. It was, it was
city hall and the people who you hire to understand, like what you were saying uh, years ago, uh, you, you just about to give you a four or five and go to city hall, they'll send it back. Or they're saying, you're about to change it. You get a three, so you never get to that mid form or that max. Right. But you, let, you asked them, uh, looking at that uh, performance evaluation, should we change that format? And that's something that we looked, I think we looked at that. So I think that if we had people that was put in place to stop uh, certain departments and people to get the max. Yeah. Okay, that, 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 you know, the question, that's a, that question not turned out a question. Yeah, uh, I remember you had asked a question to the doctors about what would you do once the extra money that was allocated for the police department, where were you going to get it from? It was never an answer. So I'm asking now, where, where are you going to get that money from? Because if you can't give the other workers a raise, so eventually you're going to have to raise the property tax, like you said. Compensate that money once that money ran out. That was for all the missing police officers. Well, as you notice in the uh, recent council meeting, uh, we used to have the uh, budget evaluation services in our meeting. They're no longer in our city council to do the whole meeting. That we can't run. So, yeah. And so we don't know what it is until they bring it back to us. Like we had to the we don't know, you know, how it's going to affect. Bottom line of our fund balance. Uh, and so uh, we don't know if we had to do an increase or not. One year after we had to do an increase, it was like it was a million. What we had to do here at home? Two cents, I think. Two cents. Two cents. Uh, tax, property tax, so that all of our employees uh, uh, would, would, would get a raise. And so um, again, uh, Mr. Phillips. We don't know if they actually bring that information back. And it could well be. But then we're going to ask the same thing. You know, we're talking about the sanitation and the point of work. What about all those vacancies in those departments? We'll never feel what you do with the extra money that we're going to put in. But you take that out and put it somewhere else. Or you put it in another department where you can hire a staff for $170,000. Or did you uh, say, well, we're not going to replace uh, a side loader truck and take that money? It's $300,000 and put it somewhere else. So it's all about what's in your budget and, 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 and being able to go back and reverse that budget. I know we had two vacancies for about two years. So that's what I'm saying. So this is still need to get a raise. So where is that money? Right. Right. We didn't put a vacancy. Yeah, we right. just filled, but we have them for two years. So that was just work with the short. He was doing the work. Wasn't any complaints. I can truly say, and I, I can show my paperwork. I didn't get anything. I've never seen it. Um, <laughs> 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 this is this is their question. Oh, no, my question. I'm trying to get you to come. Okay, all right. Everybody good with questions? I, I do want to say one thing. All right, well, and then, well. This, this is going to be, this going to be it. Uh, we want to appreciate y'all for coming, yeah. coming up and asking these questions and thinking and listening to, listen to us. But I want to say this here. We shouldn't wait to the middle of an election to have a form like this. We should start at the beginning of a year that the if uh, the election is going to be, we should start before. So we can get more on the informed in so people can really see who they voting for and who they not voting for. Yes, sir. And all those that don't want to come to the farm, that's when we should vote each and every one of them out. Amen. Because right. they don't get not listening to what we got Uh, so, for the, for the record, um, Mr. Petra is, is saying these things in his capacity as a citizen, not representing uh, 
the organization. No, I'm not, I'm not representing the NAACP. I'm not representing UP 150. We, we are here to protect and to serve and to make sure they get their fair share. All right. All right. All right. All right. So what we're going to do now at this time is we're going to ask everybody to sign in the signing sheets. I will allow the candidates one minute to answer the questions about education. And then we're going to move to comments. At this time, um, we're prepared to conclude the forum. So feel free to exit if you'd like to stay and hear the comments or ask one or make a comment yourself. Feel free. But, well, we'll allow room for the space to well, y'all look at the video because y'all need to hear the comments. I hate you leaving, letting them leave before they hear the comments. That, that's the most important part. Because I got something I need to say. But to answer the question about education, uh, the city of Rocky Mountain has always been.
What I do concern, I will say this, is that my heart began to break if somebody wanted to still continue to go to a school in Nass County. That's $1,350. That's $1,350 they got to come up with, and it doesn't provide transportation. These are things that we've gone to sit in at meetings and say, man. So I think it's going to be some hardship, especially particularly those on the Eastcombe County side. And then we're not addressing some of those needs, but what could this boy council do to that when that was a legislative move? So I, and it was pushed through quickly. Uh, yeah. Before it didn't have a chance to really respond. All right, so um, is there, we're ready for comments. We need to go ahead and move into comments. But, and then if you want to ask a question, I mean, you can do that. Let's, let me make space for the comments. Um, Mr. Dancy was first. Okay, um, first of all, what y'all got to understand, you need to know the history. It's a wonder if Andre and Ruben could have got anything done because they've been fighting certain folk for 20 years. Yes. So that's one point. Right. To do what they have done and had to fight. But my problem with that is the citizens of Rocky Mount failed them because they should have been fighting that battle. So you didn't do it then, you need to come out now. And I'm hoping you're looking at it, the video. Was live. So you need to come out and help these guys fight. The next thing, the police department, they don't have to work a, a, a part-time job now because they're making the money. Right. Like Edgecombe County deputies got to work part-time jobs because they're not making the money. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the main thing is maybe people are in denial or just don't give a damn. But you got two black males, young, with this uh, uh, millennium movement, whatever they call it, because I'm 61 years old. I don't know what you call it. There ain't no name for it for me. But you got two black males that think they got the power because they got two white guys. All they got to do is do anything they want to do because it's against whatever Andre Rubin wants to do. Not what they want to do. They want to do what's right. But just because it's Andre and Rubin, they are going to get those two white guys votes. It don't matter what it is. So you need to understand that. If you don't see that, then that's a problem. Okay. And, 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 and then you need to look at how these guys are registered. At least one of them, and well, well not one of them on the council, and then the other ones that's trying to get on the council are registered unaffiliated. That's the purpose. That's the reason behind that, because they want to cater to other folk. So you need to check their voter registration, because Unaffiliated, you got to pick a Republican ballot or a Democratic ballot. So if you're going to pick a Democratic ballot in the primary, you might well stay a Democrat. Because in a general election, you can vote for anybody. But you want to unaffiliate by your name so you can cater to those boys. And you see it make a difference in Raleigh, whether you're Republican or Democrat. Look at who's in, in charge. Okay, pay increase. I've been trying to say it for the longest. you got some folk that have never worked a real job like these two black guys, they don't know how it works. I've been trying to tell folks, I've been talking to Andre about the, 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 the minimum, the midpoint, and the max. If you are given a 2% raise on an hourly raise, you're not making any money. You will never get to the midpoint. You definitely won't get to the max. So people need to understand that. Just because they throwing out 40,000 minimum or 60,000 max, you ain't going to probably see 50,000. So people need to understand how the process works. So I'm glad you pointed that out. And I'll stop right there because I'm going all night. Because I just do my live when I leave here. Any other comments? I talked to a, uh, and this is kind of piggybacking off of what Melissa uh, said. Uh, a Durham worker who's on strike. He's been with the, the sanitation worker for 20 years. You know, he's still at $40,000 a year. 40 guys. <laughs> and you talking, I'm just saying, if I think, and, and going back, since I will make it fit in with the education piece, education is the key to everything. If we're not educated on what we can do, what our rights are, if you sit there and don't say anything, nothing's going to ever be done. And so the more uh, education or we're aware of stuff to assimilate information, then nothing's going to happen, guys. So that's why I say, uh, parents, you're talking about this merger. You not know, you didn't see a lot of parents at these meetings. Did you, Teresa? I didn't see no, no parental involvement. You know, the same thing with uh, 
trying to mentor them. Every time I mentored a young child, there was hardly no parental involvement. Again, the people that are making the policies may not even have children. <laughs> right. <laughs> or particularly, or seeing how, or uh, they may have had the wherewithal or the funding or the money to send them somewhere. If it was a mm -hmm. private school somewhere. Most of us in the city, we, we sent our kids to public schools and they did well. Because we were, we were involved. There are now a lot of parental involvement in our guys into the educational piece that we're looking at. And so why would you say anything when they just do what they need? Educate, being educated knowing what you could have done, what you should have done. And hopefully we'll find more out of what we can do to fight against that of just legislators. If you look at the history of North Carolina, legislators have always done that and we had nothing to do. You may no say so. I mean, look at the history of it. Legislators have made a, a, a point to make policy happen and just threw it at us and we accept it. So we gotta look at change. Well, one of the things I like to say about education is that, and that is, I bring my, my son with me, I've been bringing him for years, to all these political conversations that we have. If you don't involve the children in this, especially for Adolf family, American descendants of slavery. Because we have no power. And with that, they have to be politically uh, into this thing. Uh, I, I, I just want to speak about a situation where my son addressed the school uh, concerning um, uh, 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 Nat Turner. It's a fanatic in school because he killed 55 people when he should have been known in all culture as Moses. And the very kid that addressed him was an Adolf kid saying, I don't want to hear about slavery no more. And we have to ask the question, are we including these kids in these conversations, even when it concerns school? I don't care what school my son go to. He's going to know his history. He's going to be outspoken. He's going to tell the truth about this. We don't invite them, nor do we bring them. We have grandchildren. You don't have children that bring grandchildren. You don't bring them to these meetings. He sits alone. He makes speeches at meetings. He's alone. He's in the SGA. They have issues. All they do is sell tickets for social function instead of video game room. And I have to have a talk with him and say, that's not your job. Your job is to handle issues at school. And how do those issues get to you by those students? There is a suggestion box. You can put your name in it, or it can be anonymous. So I said, son, make, put the issues in there. And now you, just like the organization, has to, you know, has to talk about those issues in school. That's one way of getting it done. Underhand, but that's what we got to do. And so I, I, I just wanted to express that and see more of us bring our children into these rooms, especially Adolf. We are a wealthless people. We have children who are not, my son has been in class for four years for Spanish. And the teacher understood not to teach him Spanish because he would be disadvantaged when it comes to Spanish-speaking kids. Spanish-speaking speaking kids come to America and they're given special teachers to learn English and they learn it quickly, okay? And we suggested to her that with her and him to partner them with another student and they said, no, wasn't a good idea. So that they could speak Spanish on a constant basis but we understand the dynamics of it. There's an advantage when you don't teach all children, but you teach yours. And when it comes to education, you can be the ed most educated person in the world if you don't have anywhere to plug that education in, if you're not treated fairly by your supervisor, then you're at a loss, you're at a disadvantage. And we always, as ADOPs, American descendants of slavery, we've always been disadvantaged. Look at it all across this country. 
what is taking place now. And everyone should, should thank us. Everyone that come to should thank us, American citizens of slavery, for the opportunity to be able to come to America and see your American dream because we fought for it, we was lived for it, we was breathed for it, we was lived for it. And no one wants to give us our respect, but you want to ride our backs in your effort to reach the American dream that we have had, not had the opportunity to reach here in America. Thank you. Thank you. Last time, um, gentlemen, we need money for all the four and five. <coughs> and we need to flip one of those seats. Hopefully, both of them will flip. But just say that we don't flip any item. You still going to have a four and three split. I'm just going to ask you, are you ready to talk about a new strategy? Mm -hmm. We're going to do all right. Well, thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, be safe on the way home. All right.